I had the idea to do a 10K Q&A sort of thing about a month ago when I was at 9,000 subscribers, and somehow the passage of time took place, and now I'm creeping up on 15K, so I don't really know how that happened. Um, but in all seriousness, I appreciate all the support, and I don't know, it's just cool to make things and have a lot of people enjoy those things, so that's been cool. Thank you. Part of the reason I'm making this is because I want to share some updates about what's going on with the channel and kind of what I want to do with it. Um, you may have noticed that I am posting more often, and indeed, I am posting weekly at the moment on Thursdays, and I'm currently trying to alternate between the higher effort content, you know, the, the kind of deep dives into a particular deck building subject, and the more fun content where I, you know, for example, analyze a pre-con or just talk about whatever it is that I want to talk about that day. Um, so that's currently what I'm trying to do. Uh, and there one particular type of kind of off-week content that I am going to start next month is patron deck reviews. These deck reviews are going to be very much in the style of the pre-con review. So I'm going to try and figure out what a deck is trying to do, how well it's doing at that goal, and some potential routes for improvement. So as I said, that's going to be starting up next month. I'm going to be picking decks through a lottery system, and you can go check out my Patreon for more information about that. Also on my Patreon, I am going to be posting a Glissa deck tech very soon. So that's two different reasons to check out my Patreon. That's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> with that out of the way, uh, let's get to questions. And these are going to be mostly taken from uh, a post I made on Patreon recently. What's the story behind your username? About a year ago, I needed a username for some website or other, and just my two-second on-the-spot smash together of words was Salubrious Snail. Um, cut to a few months later, I was trying to come up with a name for my YouTube channel, and that one popped back into my brain, and I kind of liked it. You know, it's snappy, it's alliterative, has a fun word, seems pretty cool. So that's what I went with. <laughs> What's your MTG story? So I learned to play Magic in 2011, and the way I got into the game is that Mark Rosewater gave a career day presentation at my middle school, and at the end of it he handed all of these, you know, 11 and 12 year olds a uh, starter deck from, from M12, uh, and so I, I got the red one, and then I just went from there. Uh, I, I started playing Limited in 2013, so my first draft was Dragon's Maze, and then in early 2014 I really got into the game. I started playing Standard and EDH, uh, and then I've played kind of off and on since then, um, picking back up very heavily in early last year, um, building, starting to build a whole bunch more Commander decks. What was the first card, deck, or mechanic that excited you? I've always been a black player, and my first deck that I can remember was a sort of black life gain-ish deck. It ran a fair amount of removal because that's just who I am as a player. And the specific interaction that I can remember between two cards is it had Tormented Soul, which is an unblockable creature, and Vampire Outcasts, which is a bloodthirst creature, which means it's bigger when it enters if uh, an opponent was dealt damage. So it almost always came in as a 4-mana four 4-4 four, four lifelink, which, honestly, not bad. Lifelink's one of the best keywords. Pretty solid. What is your favorite magic card? That one! I Shag Nightmare Weaver has always been a card I love, and it's funny because I feel like it's known for cube, you know, you do the splashy awk, but I've never played with it in a cube. Um, the place I played with it was in standard Grixis control. I ran three of it, and it was fantastic. In the faster matchups, it soaked up damage for my deck, which sadly did not run life gain. And against the control matchups, of which there were many, because that was standard at the time, uh, all the abilities are great. The, the plus two, you can exile cards, uh, which is great against Azorius control, who kind of cycles through the deck repeatedly. Um, the minus 10, if your opponent lets you get up there, just blows out a control deck, so just a great card all around, and I also just love the flavor. 
Um, I'm a big horror fan, and the idea of this kind of unknowable, otherworldly entity who's weaponizing the fears of its foes to destroy them, that's just, that's incredible to me. I love it. What does your Rule Zero conversation look like? So this is a good question, and I think for starters, it's good to make sure that decks are at similar power levels. So, you know, figure out what decks are doing, how fast they're doing them, and just make sure that things are compatible, that there's not going to be any crazy discrepancy. Um, and then next, I would say for for middling to lower power levels, it's good to check in uh, with kind of what people's intentions are for the game and what they find fun. Um, so there are things like board wipes or combos or uh, heavy duty stacks pieces where some people might not have as much fun if they're playing against those. That might not be a thing that they want to see a lot of in their game. And I think it's it's fair to kind of try and navigate that to some extent. Um, I, I will sometimes ask somebody not to play a particular deck even. Um, for example, I have a friend who has a Turgrid deck and three nights out of four, I don't want to play against a Turgrid deck. Not, not really, no. Uh, and I think that's, that's fair. Although there are kind of, there are some limits to kind of what you can request of somebody. And I think it's a tricky thing to navigate. You know, you can't just ask that every deck your deck is bad against, uh, isn't in the game. That's, that's not really fair. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think when I build a deck, if it's a particularly kind of feisty or mean or suppressive deck, I, I have some understanding that it might see less action than a deck that is, you know, nicer or, you know, offends people a little less. If you were in control of the EDH ban list, what would you do? So the EDH ban list is tricky because it's really trying to be two different things. It's trying to dictate what's too strong for CEDH, and it's also trying to dictate what's not fun for casual. And I think answering these two questions at the same time is difficult. Um, and we can think about some different cards that we might think about banning. So let's say Dockside Extortionist. Um, very good card. Maybe it should be banned. Uh, but that would be mainly a ban for CEDH and the top levels of, of kind of high power casual because it doesn't matter for random mid-range beat stacks. There aren't that many artifacts at that power level. You're not going to be doing the same sort of value loops. Um, it's just not going to have the same horrifying power level as it does uh, at, at other uh, EDH contexts. Um, similarly, we could think about a card like Armageddon. You know, you could ban that because it's not fun, but you know, it's not. That's not a ban in the conventional sense of a card game. You know, you're not banning it because it's too strong. You're banning it because it's unfun. And I think there's there's a little bit of tension there that you're trying to kind of solve these two different problems. So really, I probably wouldn't be that comfortable. Uh, dictating a whole bunch of new card allowances or disallowances for EDH just because I think it's a really hard thing to do. Um, what I would encourage is, you know, players having uh, more of a rule zero conversation, more of kind of a conversation about what they find fun and what they don't want to see in their game. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't roll up into a game with, with strangers and destroy all their lands if they're just trying to play their, their upgraded precons or something. Um, so I think it's, it's good to have an understanding about that. And I think that's an okay solution because EDH fundamentally is a, a social game, a social format. Um, if I had to ban one card for very petty personal reasons, it would be Farewell. Uh, I hate the card. I just, I think it's very lazy design. It's, it's a six mana board wipe that has no downsides other than that it's a six mana board wipe. It's probably not broken from a power level standpoint, but I just hate to see it. It's lazy. Don't like it. It also kind of uh, crowds out um, other cards like Merciless Eviction or Austere Command. So I don't know. Not, not a fan. Not a fan of Farewell. <laughs> What's your opinion on explicitly political mechanics, like Will of the Council? The cat came back. Uh, I actually really like explicitly political cards. Um, so Council's Dilemma and Will of the Council, I think, are both cool mechanics with a lot of cool design space. 
I think it's unfortunate that the two cards from those that actually ended up being good in EDH are some of the less interesting ones, but I think there's there's plenty of other design space. I think it'd be cool if they printed more of those type of cards. Um, and I think Goad is actually, Goad is a super cool mechanic. I love Goad. And I think it would be neat to kind of expand the mindset of Goad outside of creatures, just because I think Goad has kind of a natural power limitation that uh, it's not gonna be good above kind of the, the BD mid-range level of power. Um, and I think that's valid for a type of card to be, but it would be neat to see more cards that are kind of explicitly political, but play around with other resources like cards in hand and that sort of thing. Uh, I think the, I don't remember what the mechanic is called, demonstrate maybe, uh, the one where you can copy a spell if you let an opponent copy it as well. I think that one's kind of neat. That's, that's cool. Um, so yeah, I think more stuff like that would be neat. What's the most memorable deck you've played against? Sometime last year, I played against a Timna Jeska Tribal Ball Lightning deck. And that deck's vision is splendid to me. I, I love decks that, that take a really, you know, juicy, powerful commander or pair of partner commanders and use them for ridiculous end. Uh, I just love that, and I love the idea of swinging with a ball lightning for 18 at somebody's face. That's just, that's a vision I can appreciate, let me tell you. So, I, I, I'd have to go with that deck, because that's, that's the only one that comes to mind. Cat? I've gotten a handful of comments asking about the cat post and the implied cat that goes with it, uh, and thankfully, he made an appearance for this. Uh, so this is, uh, this is my boy Nico. He loves to bounce off the walls when I'm trying to record. So, yeah, he's a great guy. 